Welcome to Old Guy Tech, the OGT.TV recording studio. Technology for the rest of us. 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 Hi, this is Rob Charney with Old Guy Tech TV, and I'm here today with Ray Nutting, Supervisor, El Dorado County District Two. Ray is running for re-election in El Dorado County, and we're really glad to have Ray in the audience today. So, Ray, I want to thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to a great campaign. Oh, thank you very much. I really enjoy being in your studio. This is real uh, nice. Uh addition to Eldorado County, and it's a great way to get information out. Thank I certainly for... hope so. Yes. Okay. You're welcome. No, thank you, because it, it helps each other. So, yeah. you know, um, we're going to kind of really just get right into it a little bit. Um, you're running for re-election. Why don't you tell us the passion and what motivates you to want to run again? Oh, okay. Um, well, I got started back in the 1980s when we were dealing with land use issues, and um um, as a result of um, being in a plane crash with my uh, uh, parents and my um, wife and my uh, brother, um, found myself um, a, a transformation in uh, my life. I went from 26 years old to having um, a new bride and a wonderful uh, life that was very simple to a very complicated life where after the plane crash, my parents were killed. Um, I was burned pretty pretty severely. My wife at the time was burned severely, uh, and I recognized the fact that life was uh, very short. Um, the, the doctors wanted me to st uh, stay uh, home and and uh, basically uh, be very still for a year uh, because I had burns, and I decided I wasn't going to do that. Went on to finish my bachelor's of arts degree in history, minored in criminal justice, and as a result of of my college experience and getting to know local issues. Uh, most people in uh, do not understand how local government works. And when I learned how local government worked at the age of 26, I started getting involved at the age of 32. I ran for public office. We changed a lot of land use issues with regards to diversifying the economy of El Dorado County in my first two terms from 93 to 97, and then from 98 to 2001. Um, took uh, two terms off uh, and decided to get back in the private sector. The reason why I did that was I believe that you should serve uh, your two terms and go back into the private sector. Um, we, I sponsored the uh, charter for El Dorado County with Supervisor Mark Nielsen. I was real proud to put in term limits. And in the charter for El Dorado County, which is a document that is the legal document that binds El Dorado County, uh, uh, there's a unique provision in the charter that says no tax increase without voter approval. I'm pretty pretty happy about that. So I took two terms off and I decided that um, I needed to come uh, back to the Board of Supervisors. I gave uh, um, the public an opportunity to vote in 2008 and was elected uh, handedly in 2008 and now I'm up for re-election. Um, and what motivates me is land use. I think that we need to make sure that the economy of El Dorado County is diversified. We can't put housing everywhere. If we take the beautiful natural resources that really define the, the majestic beauty of this county and divide it, you know, divide that timberland up into parcels and the agricultural areas into parcels, it's a transformation uh, from natural resources and agriculture into housing, and I, I really want to make sure that we uh, implement our general plan that recognizes that timberlands uh, uh, will stay in timberlands, agricultural lands will stay in agricultural lands, and to put growth where there's services, proximity to jobs, don't put um, heavy loads on, on the uh, roads, uh, don't pile up the traffic. And as we build our homes, we make sure that uh, the road improvements are, are concurrent. And that, that excites me. That in a nutshell, that's great. I mean, you know, you've got a lot going on just, just in the reason why you want to run. And I think that's pretty neat. Now, something that I'm still trying to wrap my hands around a little bit and help me with this is the redistricting that took place. Sure. Uh, by law, um, every 10 years, you have to have a census. And that is everybody gets counted and you have to have equal representation um, with regards to you, who is your elected officials. You have elected officials at the county level with the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you have 
the state assembly, the state senate, and the congressional races. And the state of California has to divide these districts up and everybody has to have equal representation. You can't have somebody running for Congress in one congressional district that has less or more people uh, than another congressional district. The same thing with supervisorial districts, they have to be equally divided up. And in the last census, District 2 was about 8% too much in population and District 5 was about 5% too less. District 3, which is the Placerville region, had to gain another 4,000 people. And District 4 stayed pretty much status quo. And District uh, 1 in Eldorado Hills had about 2,000 people too much. So to put it in a nutshell, we had to redistrict the entire county, which means um, everybody has approximately 36,000 uh, voters, or I'm sorry, citizens. Mm -hmm. And the Tahoe Basin, of course, is the most regulated place in the world, and they didn't have very much growth. In fact, they uh, lost a little population. And um, so the District 5 uh, had to come over the mountain and take in Pollock Pines. Well, Pollock Pines is a wonderful part historically with District 2, and now it's in District 5. So the districts have, have, have changed um, uh, quite a bit, and um, I lost Pollock Pines, um, and we lost in District 2 a good portion of El Dorado Hills, and um, I have now Cameron Park. <laughs> Cameron Park is a great area of our county, um, and I have the historic District 2 rural areas uh, south of uh, Pleasant Valley, uh, the communities of, of uh, Pleasant Valley, uh, Mount Ockham, Omer Ranch, um, Grizzly Flat, um, Outingdale, uh, all the way down to Latrobe. And I'm pretty excited about the district. It's, it's primarily rural with about, about 13,000 uh, constituents in Cameron Park. So I've got uh, a real nice mix of uh, citizens in my district. Yeah, so you have a whole group now that you're going to have to introduce yourself to that hadn't... Uh had known you as a supervisor for their uh, their district. So well, I, I, I've been spending a lot of time walking uh, precincts. Um, I've been working very closely with the Cameron Park Community Services District. Um, I've gotten to know the new um, uh, executive director of the Com Cameron Park Community Services District and the board of directors. Um, I'm very uh, very knowledgeable about airport policies. I'm very knowledgeable about uh, fuels reduction along Cameron Park Drive. Know, know the uh, di demographics of the folks that live in the northern part of Cameron Park and the residential communities that are along Highway 50. And on the south side of Highway 50 in Cameron Park was historically District 2. Hmm. So I'm intimately involved with Cameron Park. I have family that live, live there and I have many friends that live there. And in fact, I'm going to be leaving here, going to a, uh, the Chamber of Commerce meeting with uh, Linda Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be dealing with um, quite a few issues down there in Cameron Park today. Later, uh, I'll be in uh, Kybers dealing with the potential closure wow. of the post office. Wow, yeah. And then I'll be in Pollock Pines. Um, I plan on continuing to serve Pollock Pines. My wife has her business there. My, my son, Chase, goes to school at Pinewood. And uh, my family's you know, been involved with the uh, natural resources and uh, the, the timber industry for five generations in Pollock Pines. So I'm not leaving Pollock Pines. And um, uh, I'll definitely, uh, the folks up there will have a, an advocate for them. So oh, even yeah. though they won't be my <clears throat> constituents, uh, they know, yeah. you know, they know that I'm very knowledgeable about their community, which excites them. Well, I'm sure they know that they could pick up the phone at any time and call you and you can steer them in the right direction. Right. So how to, what an exciting time for you to be able to represent new people in new places. So that's that's neat. That's well, what's really... exciting for me is I do, this will be my last term on the Board of Supervisors. Um, and uh, I'm still, I'm 50 years old, uh, 50, uh, 51 years old, and I will uh, take all the knowledge um, and be the best represent, uh, representative uh, possible. I think that there's a lot of things we can do. Implementation of our general plan. We have a window of opportunity to change public policy to be more economically friendly. I think the capital improvements plan, which is the plan for our roads and streets and our interchanges, uh, have been um, overly ambitious and I think the price tag is way too high and I think we need to revisit our capital improvements plan and I'm excited about um, revisiting that plan to lower the cost which will lower the traffic impact mitigation fees so that we can um, 
when somebody build, pulls a building permit, it is not um, overwhelmingly yes. discouraging for people that want to conduct business in El Dorado County. Well, you know, that's one of my questions is, what can you do as supervisor in El Dorado County to help attract new business and help, uh, you know, bring jobs to the county? What, what do you feel that you can contribute to that? Well, first of all, you have to have knowledge on what is the economy of El Dorado County. And if you go all the way to the top of the Sierra Nevada mountain uh, with uh, uh, the beautiful uh, 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 tundra and snow-capped mountains to the ski resorts to uh, hiking and hunting and fishing and all of those things, the thousands of things that people do with the National Forest and the recreational opportunities all the way down into the snow line, below the snow line, which is 4,000 feet. And, and the folks that have decided to, to spend their golden years living in these mountains to the commuters, to the um, folks that are telecommuting, because that is a big industry, technologies have unleashed the opportunity for people to live in some of the most majestic areas in the world. And this is one of the most majestic areas in the world, El Dorado County. Yeah. And, um, and, and by knowing that the technologies have allowed a lot of people to work from the comfort of their home is just uh, exciting. I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens of people I know that are doing exactly what you're doing, using technologies to, to work and enjoy life um, from the comfort of their home. I mean, they, they work seven, eight, nine, ten hours uh, with their technologies and their companies. I mean, I know of a, of a guy that, that works for a company in Texas. He lives in Pollock Pines. He's an ex executive director, makes a few hundred thousand dollars a year, and he flies to Texas a, a couple of times a, a month. Uh, meets with his staff and then, um, you know, manages wow. them uh, from the, the comfort of his home in uh, Pollock Pines. And I asked him, I said, why do you live in uh, Pollock Pines and your business is in uh, Texas? He said, because Texas doesn't have these beautiful mountains, yeah. these beautiful rivers, skiing opportunities, hiking. And those are the attributes I want. And technology has allowed me to live where I want, right. enjoy the right. income and have at my doorstep those beautiful accommodations that do not exist in other parts of of, of the country. Yeah. So uh, now if you understand why technology is important, then, then you'll get a better feel for the economy of El Dorado County. Now, as you move into the Placerville region and along the corridor, those are li livable opportunities that are vastly different than the rural areas. And the rural areas below 5,000 feet, of course, you've got the mighty timber industry, and we can chew up the entire program on, on, on timber, and we'll, we'll, that is important, and I work on federal policy with regards to the timber issues, and we are um, not taking care of our woods the way we need to, and we need to change federal policy, and I think we're well on our way to doing that. Now, let's go into the agricultural districts. In the general plan, we've established 50,000 acres of agricultural uh, uh, districts. There's five of them. One's uh, in uh, Pleasant Valley. One, the other one is in um, Somerset. Uh, we have one in Gold Hill, one in Garden Valley. Uh, um, and what's going on in these agricultural districts is that we have uh, uh, ag is king in those oh, those areas. We're not subdividing those lands. And, and we can see that we've got the wineries that are just taking off and really enjoying a high quality of life and putting people to work. We've got orchards that are occurring. We've got niche industries that are going on in these areas. And even though the economy is real bad, most of these folks are only either on target with their business plans or off maybe 5 and 10%. It's not like uh, the building industry where they're off literally 95 right. to 100% right. depending right. on where you're at. And it's definitely um, uh, uh, a huge downturn in our economy. Now, once you get along Highway 50, there's different opportunities. You know, obviously the commuter wants to live in, in those areas off of Highway 50. You have those higher density communities. Our general plan recognizes primarily from Placerville to El Dorado Hills is where we're going to uh, – where the growth fundamentally is going to occur, you know, we're not putting in massive subdivisions in the northern part of the county, the right. southern part of the county, above the snow line, that we're focusing responsible growth in responsible areas. And any time you propose growth, you have a lot of anxiety of those people that live there now. And we have to be uh, we have to be pro-growth in a positive way that is a positive attribute for El Dorado County. That's an economic engine. Also, we're losing retail to uh, Sacramento County yes. and Folsom, yes. and we're losing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of sales to these regions. That's why we need to have 
retail here in El Dorado Hills and, and Diamond Springs area so that folks that do bulk buying, because they're going to bulk buy in Folsom if they don't bulk buy here, right. we need to allow our citizens to bulk buy. Now, what does that mean? Well, we can build a, a large retail and have those buildings fit our areas with good facades that have maybe a Western they con blend context, in and they blend right, in, right. they have good vegetation, yep. Yep. and th th these are these are buildings with walls that have stuff in it that our people buy, yeah. and and the people that work there are our, our folks. I mean, if you go if you go into say Walmart, I, I I cannot remember a time I've ever gone into Walmart where I haven't seen friends there mm -hmm. or people that I know right. that are working there. Right. Right. Uh, it's you know it's it's a way for our citizens to be able to have the revenue stay in this county. We cannot we cannot continue to lose our revenue to Folsom, where they have our dollars to pay for their police force. Our revenue going to Sacramento County, where they use the tax increment to pay for their services on our dime. Right, that has to stop. That is a big part of uh, our general plan, where we designate those areas in in the county where we can capture lost retail. That's so, big. So is yeah. Is so. Can you? Are you aware of any uh, growth in that? Are we bringing any more big box stores into the area? Uh, what 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 is on the uh, on the block right now that's going to be very large for El Dorado County in retail? Okay. First of all. When retail comes in, it generates traffic, and you have to mitigate that traffic, so you have to have an economic plan that builds the appropriate roads so people aren't caught in traffic jams. Mm -hmm. For example, we are working on, on trying to uh, build the infrastructure for the next two generations, and you plan that now so that as we grow, the infrastructure gets built. For example, from uh, Missouri Flat to 49, we have a... a the quote-unquote historical term was a bypass because you have 4,000 parcels in South County that in the next 40, 50 years may be built depending on, on how our economy goes from this point on. If, the, if we continue to, to have those custom homes built in those rural areas, and not any new subdivisions, just what's out there, we have to get the um, the problem areas solved. That means coming into Diamond Springs, if you're going down Main Street, uh, and you don't have a secondary road going out to Missouri Flat, you're going to have traffic jams. Right. That's an opportunity to build a new road, a road that will uh, accentuate the, the character of El Dorado County and provide new businesses. And I'm hoping some uh, to capture lost retail uh, of, of a lot of these folks that are going to Folsom and Sacramento so that they can bulk buy on that new road between Missouri Flat and 49. Yeah. And I think there's opportunities in Eldorado Hills. I think that there's uh, maybe some opportunities in Cameron Park. Um, we have uh, 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 a lot of land on the south side of Highway 50 um, that we are continually um, discussing, you know, with endangered plants, and we're mitigating it by on the north side of Highway 50. We have 5,000 acres we put in plant preserves. And um, we're trying to uh, open up that land to the south of Highway 50 so that we can bring in businesses and trade and commerce and create some wonderful jobs. Now, it's an exciting time for our economy because a lot of people really enjoy the quality of life in El Dorado County and they are bringing their businesses here. For example, we have a new company called uh, Boo Solar. Boo Solar is a research and development company that... Uh, was uh, looking to go to Folsom, Rancho Cordova, or El Dorado County. Well, Supervisor Knight and I both met with the company, and we, uh, we in a very short time frame of about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, we recognized that we needed to, to, to accelerate the permitting process and get them through uh, the county. And by God, uh, within um, five days, they were uh, well through the permitting process, and they established their new home, El Dorado County, and they're going to... Uh, do research development on new solar technologies that will capture more of the sunlight with uh, uh, new technological um, abilities to generate um, uh, energy from these solar panels. It's, it's cutting edge stuff. I can't tell you how many exciting businesses we have um, along Highway 50 and Cameron Park and El Dorado Hills that 
uh, are just cutting edge stuff. I mean, we're dealing with technologies that deal with national defense. We, we're dealing with satellite imagery. We, we control satellites out of uh, Eldorado Hills from all over the world. In fact, it, it's a lot of the satellites we use for telephones and internet, um, um, they're, they're being uh, controlled by command centers in, in Eldorado Hills. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an exciting place for these people to, to come and work. Can we do a better job? Absolutely. But um, we have a lot to offer here right. in Eldorado County. Well, I agree with you. And I, I go far enough back to know about the Intel uh, situation where we almost had Intel. I mean, we've came very close right. to have them in Eldorado County. And, and, and in some respects, we blew that. But, okay, you brought up something that you were able to help this particular company, you and Supervisor Knight, uh, get through the permitting process. That's one of the things that we hear all the time uh, from people going into the county to put in permits or do whatever. They feel, you know, it's an absolute nightmare. It's, uh, that, that's, that's, there's, it's like there's no friendliness in doing a permitting process in El Dorado County. Right. Are, are we trying to improve that or are we staying status quo? Is it a lack of staffing because we've, we've had to let some people go? Why is it that it seems so difficult to get through the permitting process in Colorado County? Well, I guess it's human behavior when any time you have to go through a process where you have to get um, 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 your documents reviewed um, and state law intervenes stating that you had, for example, when the San Francisco earthquake hit in the 1980s, the state of California responded by having a statewide uh, earthquake retrofit code compliance policy. So now the, the Eldorado County that might have a significant earthquake once every say 100,000 years, we have, to, we have to earthquake retrofit upon a new permit as if we were down in, like in downtown San Francisco or Los Angeles, where you have the San Andreas Fault. Right. So you, so what happens is, is we get in this vacuum of overregulation and have to implement it at the local level. So what we're doing at the county level is to, is to let those folks that are going into the permitting process know that we're at the mercy of the state of California because counties, there's 58 counties in the state of California, we are a subdivision of the state. And when I take my oath of office, I take my oath of office to the public to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and uphold the Constitution of the state of California. Even though there's lots of things in the Constitution of the state of California that are problematic for me, I still have, the, I still have my oath to uphold those rules. And in doing that, um, in the building department, uh, probably about 90% of what we do in the building department is, is following state law. For example, we have no liability when a, when a in, county inspector goes out and inspects a building. And let's say the inspector does a great job and there's no problems, which is most of the time. Or let's say a building inspector misses something and as a result, um, it costs the contractor or the landowner a lot of money. Well, there's no liability at the county level. We are exempt from liability, but we have an inspection program that uh, tries to keep everything built up to state code right. implemented at right. the county level. It is pretty frustrating. Now, the permit fees is just not the building department fee. It is the school fee. Right. It's the EID fee. It is the traffic impact mitigation fee. It is a whole series uh, of the fire department fee, a whole series of fees that create a large price tag. Now, one of the things I'm looking at in um, is that we need to get together with the fire department, we need to get together with schools, and we need to get together with the traffic impact mitigation fees. Remember, we're talking about looking at the future infrastructure right. and lowering those costs uh, so that we can lower those fees. For example, the Economic Development Advisory Committee is looking at the cost of future infrastructure. And I'll give you a classic example. The Cameron Park Interchange, if we were to build what's on the books now, for the, for the Cameron Park Interchange is in excess of $65 million. And it's going to be far more than that when you have to uh, look at those businesses that will be affected by expanding that interchange. It is in, in the amount of housing that will, will gravitate to that interchange is less than about 2,300 new homes. It's not enough homes to justify a, a, a above $65 million interchange. 
So what we want to do is take a look at what opportunities do we have to build the proper infrastructure that's expected by the citizens that have already paid their fees, future folks that are coming into our community, and we're looking at solving the plant reserve issue, doing a flyover from um, um, Palmer, Palmer Drive uh, um, in Chaparral. We need to connect those two roads on the north side and then jump across the freeway into that new territory. And, uh, you know, Cameron Park Estates can fly over there to get their kids right. to Ponderosa. South Shingle Road folks can get can fly over there to get over to Albertsons. And it makes a very nice lower cost capital improvement, which should lower the traffic impact mitigation fees. So I think there's lots of opportunity to deal with um, uh, the fee schedules. The public needs to recognize the fact that um, uh, it is just not the county fees. It's a conglomerate of fees. I think that the fire departments need to uh, look at that fee schedule and, 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 and operate differently with less money. I think that uh, schools need to recognize the fact that the average fam the average person that's coming into El Dorado County is seniors that don't even have kids. And if we're collecting revenue to build schools where we're not filling these schools, we need to get we need to understand the dynamics of that. I mean, right. the idea right. of everybody that moves in is going to have 1.5 children isn't right. It, it, it's not playing out. So why are we collecting those revenues? And we have two or three schools that are uh, brand new in this county that are shut down. Hmm. I, mean, I think we need to get real with that. The big one of the biggest things we can do is to take this economic downturn and reinvent um, ourselves as far as county government. And technologies are going to allow us to do that by investing in new technologies as people retire or leave their employment. We don't backfill those those jobs as much as possible. And we do more. Um, we do more with less people, and we take advantage of new technologies that, that will allow us to efficiently uh, provide services. I mean, I would love to have a system where somebody comes in and um, one department has an application that's recognized by another department, and instead of having people shuffled from one department to the next department, you have an application process that, that it's accessible from the comfort of your home, and you do your business without having to travel to El Dorado County uh, departments to take care of your business. Right. Um, the criminal justice system with uh, Sheriff D'Agostini and Craig Sly and Vern Pearson, um, these are elected officials that are looking at how do we have a criminal justice system where from intake to exit, we have a continuum of information that's accessible so that we don't have dupli duplications in services. I mean, to have somebody arrested and do a, um, uh, you know, a write-up on that and then have the district attorney uh, uh, having to do their own thing. And uh, and then, you know, you have the evaluation of the courts and the judges. And, and you should have a system where everybody's talking on the same page. This is an exciting time to utilize new technologies in order to create uh, downsizing of government. Um, we are forced to downsize government. We Our budget, uh, just to let you know, our our budget is down 34 uh, percent, uh, 16 percent. Uh, we're down 16 percent in, in the past five years with uh, full-time employees. So we're forced by nature of the county budget to downsize and streamline. And that's what we're doing. Unfortunately, at the state level, they uh, have not tightened their belt to the full extent possible. And they are in a world of hurt, their anticipated revenues is 1.2 billion short of what they anticipated coming in, and they've overspent by I think about 1.5 billion. So now we have the state of California looking to balance their budget again, and typically they they go to local governments. We have the federal government that just prints money. I mean, we used to have a gold standard, and now we talk about uh, gross national product. Yeah. And, um, and that's not real. You've got to have a, a basis to have value with your revenue, just not print money for the sake of printing money. I mean, we're looking at going from $1.2 at the federal level with our budgets to $14 trillion within the next 15, within the next 15 years. That's sure. outrageously yeah. wrong. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's basically burdening our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, to solve problems that we should be solving right now. I think that self-responsibility starts with each and every one of us as to how we can take care of ourselves and manage our lives in a way that doesn't burden others or future generations. To generate 
the revenue now on the backs of our children is just simply wrong. Right. Absolutely. You know, you brought up the technology end of things a little bit. And um, one of the things that I'm aware of uh, is how old some of the legacy systems that we're running in the county uh, IT department. Uh, IT could be very expensive. Um, how is the board looking forward as far as what they're going to do with IT? Well, we've been doing a lot over the last six months. First, we have, as a board, decided on a 5-0 vote that we are going to enter into the next, um, we have a three-year plan that's, that uh, we'll look at a five-year plan. The three-year plan is basically identifying those technologies that connect departments better um, um, and uh, to start employing uh, those technologies in order for the county to, to function at a higher level. For example, um, in uh, February of '09, I, I get a, a, a memo from uh, Google, and Google says that we will offer you an email service um, um, that will uh, give you um, better access, um, um, easier to understand, et cetera, et cetera. And so that laid on my desk for about a year and then I started asking, you know, questions about well, why why don't we go to a better uh, uh, email system? Lo and behold, um, as the discussion unfold, that was the first technological change we're making, and we're implementing that as we speak, moving from uh, uh, moving into the Google world, so that we have a more broader. Um, um, opportunity, more accessibility to services, and um, an easier understanding of how to use the email system. Right. Because it is confusing, and the training it takes is phenomenal. Well, and, it, and, and, and we need to, so that's the first thing we're doing, right. and, and we've already done it. The next thing we're doing is to, taking, to take a look at what works in, in the software, software world and what doesn't work. Now, I will tell you from my perspective, IT has folks... Um, that are employed, that are doing a fantastic job. But at the same time, when you when these folks work for government, there's a, a safety zone there. There's a, I think, uh, uh, the opportunity to be innovative and take risk. Um, when you are employed as a government employee isn't as high as when you work in the private sector. I think that... Um, my faith is in the private sector. I, I, when I talk to folks that are involved with technologies, uh, you know, from folks that write the software to the people that purchase the appropriate software, my faith is in the private sector. I've told our CAO and I've told uh, technological folks in, at our county that it's been my experience that thinking outside of the box to get the right product, um, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, so the IT, the, we put an IT team together with um, our department heads, and we're looking at thinking outside of the box with the appropriate technological opportunities to connect our departments better. And we're willing to spend the money as long as as we employ these different technologies. We can see that will by attrition or people changing jobs or even laying, you know. Uh, even a job that doesn't become necessary anymore, we can retrofit our 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 county team uh, with the appropriate revenues coming in, the income versus the expenses, so that we can balance our books better going out five years, ten years, right. fifteen, and twenty. Well, uh, criminal justice, there's opportunities to get people to talk better there. Um, the way we interact with mental health, health services, there's better opportunities to communicate better there. And it's an exciting time. We yeah. have a CAO yeah. that uh, has the majority of her adult life. Terry Daly has worked in the private sector. She's mm -hmm. pretty excited about the technological opportunities. And so that's just one area where we can uh, become lean, mean, and efficient. Well, I hope so, because you're running some legacy systems there that uh, when a few individuals that I know of are going to retire, you're going to lose that institutional knowledge of how to run some of this equipment. So it's going to be important that you keep moving forward. And, and yeah. we have that responsibility because we... Um, Hey Rob, I'm just sitting here and looking out your window and see, my so, turkeys, huh? see some wild turkeys sitting right, <laughs> walking right by the window here. That's the beauty of living where we live. Well, I'm a hunter, and Thanksgiving yeah. has come and gone. <laughs> anyway, um, 
No, I would agree with you that if we do not address these technological issues that um, the archaic systems that are in place may fail us, and we have a responsibility to those people that own properties, that pay their taxes, that are, are recording their new properties, right. or um, um, all of those interactions need to be as efficient as possible. Yeah, and, and what I always see in some government is that they tend to just push everything off. You know, IT sometimes is the redheaded stepchild in the, in the group where they don't get the funding and upgrading that they need to do. All of a sudden, 15 years has gone by. They're running on a legacy system that when the individual retires, nobody knows how, how to run it, and then you're in a real, real trouble. So you have to be, in the IT world, obviously that's my world, you have to be proactive. Now, in, now yeah. IT, information services is very expensive. Our Board of Supervisors is committed to allocating the resources to transition us from the old systems to the new systems, but we are very cautious um, looking at that transformation. We want, uh, if we purchase, say, a million dollars worth of technological improvements, we're going to want to see a million dollars plus worth of savings because the whole idea is to create efficiencies through new technologies. And my vote will never be yes if we can't demonstrate how, through the employment of new technologies, how we're going to downsize the cost of government to, to more than make up the investment of those technologies. And it is possible. It is possible, but I think you need to also look at the fact that IT is something that grows every day. It's something new, something going on. You're not necessarily going to save money, but you're going to have to stay up on the curve because as, as I just mentioned, with the legacy systems that we've got running in this county, you could come to a crashing halt. And more than just saving money, Ray, you've got to be, make sure that things are efficient. And within that efficiency, hopefully that'll save the money that well, you're looking I, for. The, you know, the Board of Supervisors is made up of five representatives that all are unique and have their own character. So I'm only speaking for me right now, not the full board. I can tell you what the full board has done. But from my perspective, I would like to see the Board of Supervisors put an IT uh, uh, committee together of some of the most brightest people in El Dorado County. You know, Gordon Helm, folks uh, that uh, guy, folks like Gordon Helms that uh, knows about uh, uh, information technologies, and to get those folks to take a look at the proposals by the county staff to say, you know what, this is this is some great stuff, and it's going to work. Like I said when we started this discussion, I have a, a huge amount of faith in the private sector. Those folks put on the line their resources and they're dependent on that decision to get to the end product, which is a profit. And the county has the, the, the county has uh, you know a different perspective from the private sector. And so when I see that energy and the momentum and the excitement of the private sector that looks at these technologies and we employ those, at the county level that are used in the private sector, I think we have opportunity. For example, if we have a contract, an IT contract to uh, purchase uh, uh, you know, software, I want to make sure that it's software that is adjustable, that can change, and that it's, it's a contract that allows for us to have the flexibility to change depending on, on market demands. Not get trapped in, in a software that um, is single focused. Right. It's not multiple focused and doesn't allow us the flexibility to change. I mean, our county is different than San Francisco. Our county is different than Los Angeles. Our county is is different and we need need the technologies that fit our county. I mean, you take a look at at the 1.2 million acres that make up our county, 600,000 of it, we depend on the federal government. And then we have, you know, two incorporated cities and we are every Every county has its own dynamics, and we need to make sure the systems fit El Dorado County. Absolutely. So do you feel that there's um, any needs right now that the county isn't um, addressing um, that, that you see or you feel in the horizon that the county needs to address? Well, there's so many things. I mean, for example, I come out of natural resources, and for me, the, the, the number one problem in El Dorado County with regards to potential loss of life and property is catastrophic fire. I've been working for uh, all my adult life to educate people as they move into El Dorado County how to uh, uh, 
live with natural resources and to reduce the fuel loads and that we take personal responsibility for taking care of the areas where we live. And um, that's huge because we have these deep canyons, we have these uh, folks that are living close to each other, and if we have a conflagration of, um, of a wildland event where embers are being blown out in front of the fire uh, half a mile, we have to be able to defend these communities. And we've set up 27 fire safe councils. We've worked with the state of California and the federal government to get incentivize reducing fuel loads and by investing, uh, for example, in say if you invest uh, $500 per acre for fuels reduction, you could probably save about $20,000 worth of, of fire suppression costs. The only time this really gets on the radar screen of our citizens is not, you know, like right now during Thanksgiving and, right. and, and Christmas when the ground is wet and lots of snow in the high country and rain and everything is damp. The, the citizens get real excited about it when, when there's an actual fire. Yeah. But th that it's too late then. It, it, that's human nature. Okay, though. the next thing that, that um, we need to really focus on is to continue the diversification of our county so that future generations um, aren't, our, our county isn't dependent on one economic engine. We have to have multiple economic engines uh, that make our, our county so, so vastly wonderful. We are one of the top counties in the state of California that uh, economically we're doing great. No county is doing fantastic, but I'd say we're one of the top five counties in the state of California that uh, if counties start going bankrupt, we would be one of the last. We are so diversified in this county. We have the majestic international crown jewel of, South, of the Tahoe Basin with South Lake Tahoe. Neighbors are, are Nevada, where they've got uh, tourism, uh, economic opportunity, natural beauty. You take a look at the landscape of the Western Slope, and the and, and we grow uh, uh, the national forest grows 200 million board feet. The private lands grow probably 100 million board feet. Uh, we have recreation, ski resorts. We have Apple Hill. We have the wineries. We have. Um, all kinds of niche markets. We have telecommuters. Uh, another thing that um, uh, our county is looking at is we put together a broadband uh, committee. We have some of the top um, uh, broadband advocates in our county, and uh, quite frankly, I'm very excited about micro trenching. Uh, uh, hard line through uh, many of our county roads to give accessibility to high-speed technologies. Would that be nice? Oh, it, it, the technology, and, and um, I'm sticking my neck out here, but the opportunity to micro-trench, they have a machine out there that can uh, micro-trench micro in the center of our roads that will allow us to lay hard line, um, high-speed fiber optics. Yeah. And um, if we were to committed to start employing that, um, it would be just a fantastic uh, uh, attribute to Eldorado County. I mean, Eldorado County is right next to the state capitol. Yeah. And yeah. we have lots of folks that would, um, the trade and commerce of our state capitol and having these high quality areas to live with high speed fiber optics in, 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 in you know, that are laid out in our roads as we fix these roads would be just astronomical. No, the, I, I, our board of supervisors last, uh, two years ago, um, entered into a contract to truncate um, uh, fiber optics throughout the, uh, 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 from 49 north of, uh, of Placer County all the way down to Tuolumne County to truncate through the Foothills community to connect with the fiber optics laid in the San Joaquin Valley. Now, there's two aspects to that. One aspect is the public uh, relationship and the private relationship. We're laying that fiber optics with a company called Scenic, and Scenic is going to uh, hook up the public entities with high-speed uh, technologies. It'll come right into Placerville, down into, uh, I think it'll go all the way down to Sonora and then go back out into the San Joaquin Valley. I think it'll come out of uh, Chico someplace, and, and we've entered into that contract. Then in, also in that trench will be um, the opportunity to truncate out for the private sector. So for private communities that want to pick up the expense to, to micro trench right. to connect with that, they can start truncating off of high, uh, Highway uh, 49. That's exciting. The other thing we can do is we can bring fiber optics up highway, uh, high speed fiber optics, and it's already in the, in the, in, uh, to some extent into the city of Placerville right. and other areas. Right. We could do right. a far better job serving these rural areas. Could you imagine having the best technologies in the world and living in some of the most majestic areas of yeah. the world? How many 
how many six-figure jobs we well, can create from the comfort of our own home. Look at my own example here. I'm working out. You saw the turkeys, the wildlife. I love it, you know, what we're doing here. But you know, I cannot get DSL into this location here. There's no fiber here whatsoever. Comcast will not come in here. There's nothing there. My only two choices were two T1s from uh, uh, Covat. And I'll tell you what, very, very pricey. And uh, I, all the neighbors all around, same, same situation. So that's kind of a different issue. Well, uh, but let's finish with, on that issue by saying this. When electricity was invented, it became a household necessity within a generation. Right. Within two generations, 90% of America was hooked up through electrification and federal policy and state policy and the, and the desire to have that technology. Within 20 years of, of inventing TV, it became a household item. Look at the last inventions uh, over the last 20 years, the, uh, the cell phone, the car phone, right. uh, the iPod, all of these things. High speed technologies is going to be a desire by the public. And it, the, the mere fact that this is something that has to occur will drive public policy. I'm already on board. Yeah. with with broadband and getting those technologies in place. We need to be ahead of the curve so that we can be the first part, one of the first participants in it to draw those people that want both the high incomes and high yeah. quality of life. Well, you know, and that's what you mentioned. I mean, the, the whole the whole situation is we've got so many people that live in this area because they they want to because of the wildlife, because of the beauty of this. And we're sitting here in an area where, you know, you can't get high speed Internet. I mean, it's just ludicrous. But, but that's a, that's, again, another another thing. We're we're getting close to the end of our time here. And um this is one of my questions that I, I've asked other people. I'm going to ask you too. If you had a magic wand, let's just say you had a magic wand and you could cast it over El Dorado County, what is it that you feel would be the most important thing that we need to do here? Oh, wow. That, that, what a wonderful question. Um, I believe in the human spirit. I believe in self responsibility and self reliance. If I had a magical wand, I would I would want it to be uh, waved over the state of California, and I would want the regulations imposed upon us by the state of California to recognize the fact that we at the local level, the spirit of the the pioneer spirit lives within within our culture, our history to solve our own problems and to. Um, uh, start looking at these regulations and getting rid of them. I mean, for example, uh, um, the last the, the last legislation took all of our our gold dredgers out of the river. These are just recreationalists, and these are most of them are from the urban areas that want to come out and have fun, getting a little little bit of gold. State of California said, um, "Nope, we're going to have a five year moratorium," and it's just ridiculous. Um, so that would be the first one, would be the state of California to have faith in local citizens that we are very much involved with doing the right thing and taking care of our environment. The next thing would be is the federal government allowing us at the local level to be an integral part of managing these federal lands, that we care and live here and we, we would... we understand what it means to take care of these resources and to utilize it on in a sustainable way and i have great faith in those of us that live here that that want to be self-reliant and 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 have a future that 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 we can mold rather than have it come out of san francisco and los angeles and in washington dc i have great faith in the american spirit and the spirit of those of us that live in eldorado county um, the other the other one I would like to have waived is that we incentivize people to go to work. We shouldn't incentivize people to stay at home. And we do. Through federal policy, through state policy, there is so much revenue that tries to take care of everybody from cradle to death that, um, that I think gets away from incentivizing people to actually go to work. Yeah. And... and um, the other thing is that we need to recognize is that we have an abundance of natural resources. I mean, we've only tapped, uh, from the gold rush to today, we've tapped um, the majority of the gold that exists in these mountains, the easy gold to get. But there's only we've only tapped maybe 
less than 3% of the gold that exists in these these mountains. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fiber and the timber that grows, we waste, in, in, uh, according to Robert D'Agostini, who has a, a, a timber operation and a really young, bright man, that uh, he was telling me that, that we had 24 million board feet of timber that rotted and landed on the ground. And is that sustainable? No, it is creating a catastrophe in, in terms of catastrophic fire. Yeah, yeah. And all we have to do is better, I'm, if we just better manage our natural resources, we could get out of this budgetary crisis in the state of California. Yeah, I think, I think have, the state it, of California's regulations has caused the, the economic crisis, not the entrepreneur uh, free enterprise spirit. I think that the that both the uh, both the, the the assembly and the state senate need to recognize that the human spirit just unleash them. They will take care of California's financial problems. Right, right. Well, the dredging was a good example. My understanding from some of the science, and, and I, I I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but that the they were showing that the dredging was actually helping the rivers. Well, I I got lots of friends, and I've been know. in the river myself. And when you suck up a sediment and you clean that sediment and take out uh, mercury and you collect it and you deliver it to environmental management, you're taking a pollutant out of the river. But no, Mm -hmm. what happens at the state of California, they listen to the uh, quote unquote, the environmentalists, they line up and they want the dredgers out of the river. And they're giving the wrong message to the state legislature that listened to the wrong message. It is, it's just, it's really frustrating where you have these folks from high populated areas listening to pure nonsense. Yeah, it, it, it's just crazy. It really is. Well, listen, Ray, it's been great having you. I want to give you 30 seconds to a minute. You look in that camera right over there. You get that message out and tell the people what you want to tell them. Okay. El Dorado County has been home to my family uh, for generations. I have uh, 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 the next generation that's going to be following behind me, and it's my I wish that uh, uh, they stay here and enjoy the high quality of life and the opportunity to, to trade in commerce like I have. Um, it's a beautiful place from the High Sierra all the way down to the, the Sacramento County line. We have just tremendous economic diversity. Um, I am going to be running for re-election. I'll be only spending four more years here as a county supervisor. And I'd like to, to uh, offer to you folks um, my knowledge and experience and my enthusiasm to uh, help guide the future of Eldorado County for the next four years. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can email me at raynutting at hughes.net. That's R-A-Y-N-U-T-T-I-N-G at hughes.net. H-U-G-H-E-S dot net. Raynutting at hughes.net. Thank you. That's great, Ray. Hey, I want to thank you very much for joining us. I, You're welcome. I want to do this again uh, in a couple of months and see if the, the your opinions and your ideas have changed, have grown, or whatever has happened. But I'd love to have you come back. We really enjoy having you. You're a real friend of ours, and we appreciate it. And for you folks out there, thank you very, very much for watching this interview. Uh, it was a great time with Ray. We really appreciate him coming in. And uh, we appreciate you watching. So make sure that you keep watching and keep looking for the, the new Uh, interviews and all the other technology related stuff that we're bringing to you and we'll see you next time thank you this is Rob Charney with Old Guy Tech TV see you then hi this is Rob Charney with Old Guy Tech TV and I want to talk to you today about Windfall Windfall has two outstanding offers for you to take advantage of they have their 12 week business only ad for just $60 that's just $5 a week you're not gonna find a better deal anywhere Windfall has a rewards program like no other, a real windfall. Give us five and your ad is free. So refer five people or businesses and you get your ad for free. Visit Windfall on the web at www.shopthewindfall.com or call 530-621-1698. Everybody needs a windfall. Thank you, Windfall. See you soon.